Thank you for watching the Tank Museum's YouTube channel and don't forget to subscribe. This tank chat is going to be about this vehicle, uh, the Jagdkanone or JPZ 4-5. It's a German built and also actually it was actually built in Belgium as well, uh, post-war tank destroyer. So a vehicle that was put together in that period we now know of as the Cold War, uh, specifically to try and defeat what was then the threat, which would be Soviet tanks coming from uh, the Warsaw Pact or the Eastern Bloc. Now, Germany was stopped having an army in 1945, but NATO, by the mid-1950s, are realising there's a resource in Germany, or West Germany as it then was, that could be an ally to the NATO troops. And with the height of the Cold War going on, that idea of not using the resources of Germany or West Germany at the time is, is they're missing out. So the Bundeswehr is allowed to be created, a new German army for West Germany. Now that initial army, that force, was equipped mainly with American equipment, but straight away they start programs to equip themselves in the manner that they want. And a number of Wehrmacht officers from World War II, they help establish that new Bundeswehr. And of course, they've had the experience in the Second World War of the use of tank destroyer or Panzer Jaeger type vehicles. In other words, a track chassis with a powerful anti-tank gun on. And we know how the Sturmgeschütz moves or morphs over from being uh, a vehicle that's there to support the infantry to again being a very effective tank killing weapon, especially because it's got a low profile without the turret. So the Germans start a program to try and create that tank destroyer that they want. And the first offering that comes back at the end of the 1950s is not considered acceptable enough. It's based on the HS-30 armoured personnel carrier that's put into service. It's actually a Swiss built chassis with a British engine in. Um, they put a 90 millimetre gun on the front of it. It's imbalanced, it doesn't really work that well. So they go back to industry and uh, in 1960 to 1962, three companies come forward with five prototype vehicles for the German military to have a look at. Those companies are Henschel, Hanamag, and the Swiss company Mowag puts together one vehicle that comes forward. The other two companies have two prototype vehicles. Now those vehicles are looked at by the German military. It initiates another round of building prototype or testbed vehicles from 62 to 63. This time it's down only now to Hanamag and Henschel and they make three prototypes each. And then there's a final series of prototype vehicles between 63 and 65. Those vehicles, again, three each from the two manufacturers, and that leads to really a combined effort that becomes the Jagdkanone, the vehicle behind me. Now, those two companies are given equal shares of a 750 order production run. Um, so uh, 375 vehicles each are, put, uh, are built by Henschel and Hanamag and it's part of also a bigger sort of family or range of vehicles that the Germans are looking at at the time. They're thinking that this chassis might be useful for a reconnaissance vehicle. That doesn't actually take off. They think it can also be used for an anti-tank missile carrier that does follow on and uh, what becomes called the Raketa, um, which is basically a missile carrying version of this vehicle, goes into production after they finish the 750 of the Yadkin owners. And they also are looking at a replacement armoured personnel carrier, which becomes the Marder and that these projects actually interlo interweave at certain times in their history. But what do you get with a, uh, a Yankanona? Uh, so it's based around the anti-tank gun they're using. They look originally at the gun that's on the American M47, M48, but they Rheimatel adapt it. It becomes a new gun that Rheimatel patents. And that's this 90 millimeter gun you can see here. It's got a double muzzle brake or double baffle on the end of the muzzle brake there. 
It's got a fume extractor just behind it. And it's a gun that fires a combination. You can either fire Hesh rounds, high explosive squash head at anti-tank targets. That doubles up as a good HE round as well. Or it can fire heat rounds, high explosive anti-tank, in other words, hollow charge. And this can fire and knock out most Soviet vehicles in that uh, late 50s, early 60s period, um, out to about 2,000 meters. Now, to crew it, there's a crew of four. Obviously, the gunner who's uh, looking after this gun in terms of the aiming it, he's inside this, so you've got a driver on one side, gunner on the other, nearer to me, and the loader is slightly set back behind the driver, and the gun is offset to the left slightly to give the loader just a little bit more room when he's loading. About They've got about 51 rounds of the ammunition, this 90 millimeter ammunition, stowed inside the vehicle and a good crew, they can fire about 12 rounds in a minute, um, aimed rounds at a, at a target, as I say, out to about 2,000 metres away. Commander's further back, so that's a fourth member of the crew. Uh, the commander has, again, you can see he's got periscopes around his sight there. Um, this is a vehicle that, again, at the time, they're looking, because of its role as a tank destroyer role, keep its profile low, that's something they're picking up from the Second World War, and keep the armour protection on the front. So the thickest armour, as would be expected, is on that front angled plate, and that's about uh, five centimetres, 50 millimetres there, angled armour, the rest around the sides, etc., is an awful lot thinner. But again, one of the things, that profiling, keep the vehicle hidden, it's really an ambush weapon, uh, and then it can manoeuvre using, and again, we'll see its mobility in a moment, manoeuvre to another position for further ambush. It's that anti-tank capability is what it's all about. Mainly, it was expected to be supporting some of the infantry units, mortar units, etc. Now, when we look at it, uh, in terms of power, in the back, there's a Daimler-Benz engine there. It's a diesel engine, eight-cylinder, that produces about 500 horsepower. So it's a powerful engine that can motor this vehicle, that mobility factor. It can get around quickly, about 70 kilometers an hour on the open road. And that's speedy for a vehicle that comes in at about 27 tons. The drive from the engine goes through a rent gearbox, uh, and the drive is at the back there. That's where you'll see that sprocketed wheel um, that's powering the vehicle along. Rubber tracked, double tr pinned. You can notice here the double pin on the track there. Pretty wide track as well. Uh, similar track that you'll see later on on vehicles like the Marder. Double road wheels each side. Uh, torsion bar suspension and each of those road wheels has a shock absorber on it apart from the middle one and there's three return rollers going across the top there um, keeping that uh, track nice and level keeping it straight on the uh, on its runners as it were. Um, so from the point of view we've looked at the armour protection there Armament, they also add a couple of MG3 machine guns. That's basically the development of the uh, MG42 that goes into modern Bundeswehr service. Uh, one is you can actually fit either with the commander or on the other side with the loader on their cupola, supposedly with a anti-aircraft capability. And there's also a coaxial one on that mounting for the gun. That gun, when it's actually in a fixed position with the tank static, it's got a 15 degree lateral movement either side, 15 degrees up or eight degrees of depression. So again, they're thinking of using these guns in pre-prepared positions, sometimes scrapes, but with that idea, it's fire, scoot and move to another position once you've ambushed your oncoming enemy tanks. Now this vehicle, we say, it goes into service with the German military. They actually have it in service till about 1990 um, where it's finally retired. A number of them, about 162 I think it is, actually go back to the factories to become rebuilt as one of the four versions of the rocket carriers that the Germans uh, put into service. Early models have the SS-11 anti-tank missiles, later ones have a Euro missile hot system on there, um, and those go in service and they're in service much longer. 
1972, Belgium goes to Germany and they order 80 of these vehicles that actually get assembled at Anvers in, in Belgium. And this is one of those vehicles. They're called Improved. They have slight changes on them uh, for service in the Belgium army. So this particular example of the Yadkin owner was actually given to us uh, by the Belgium, Belgium military some years ago. And uh, it's had a, a, a fairly rough life here at the Tank Museum. I say rough, it's seen a lot of mileage. Uh, I remember when I first came here, this was regularly the threat or the enemy vehicle used by the Ruritanians when we did our tanks in action battles. And it was a very reliable vehicle, which is why it always seemed to come out and get driven around all the time. So you can see as I'm standing next to it, it's got that classic key features of a, of a, of a tank destroyer, low profile, hidden, hasn't got the turret, that means it's cheaper, easier to use, but again, as we were looking at before with tank destroyers, one of those systems that seem to get overtaken in time by missile carriers and not that many countries followed up on the idea of the tank destroyers and the Germans certainly don't in terms with a direct fire weapon like this 90 millimeter gun on this particular example. Interesting nonetheless and that idea of the German military, not a hangover but a progression I would argue um, from their use of uh, the Panzer Jaeger type of tank destroyer that they were doing in the Second World War used well into the second half uh, of the 20th century. We have a fantastic selection of books, models, clothes and other gifts on the Tank Museum online shop. When you buy from our online shop, you are supporting the Tank Museum charity and that means we can carry on caring for our collection and producing this content. If you have supported us already, thank you very much, subscribe and do keep watching.